welcome back to Worldwide Exchange. Right the BRIC nations. It's a huge topic for the BRIC countries as they hold... As leaders of the world's largest emerging market economies... The so-called BRIC nations are holding their first ever summit as a group. They were the talk of Wall Street for a decade. The future of globalization, they were supposed to challenge the status quo. But do you remember the BRICS? The BRICS? No. No. <laughs> Uh, is it a tariff spat between US and China or...? Nope. The BRICS stand for Brazil, Russia, India and China, and sometimes South Africa. The term was coined by Goldman Sachs chief economist Jim O'Neill in 2001, just days after 9-11. It started to make me think that globalization, essentially equating to Americanization, was over. By that November, he issued the first report. He argued that the four emerging economies would be growing so fast, they deserve to have a bigger voice in global governance. But opponents said it was a marketing ploy. And one of the main points I was trying to make was actually about shrinking the representation of European uh, members of uh, the Eurozone and making uh, a more effective G7 than the one that existed. So quite how that could be translated into some kind of marketing slogan, I have absolutely no idea. The second report, Dreaming with the Bricks, The Path to 2050, was published two years later. The predictions were bold. By 2040, the BRIC countries could take over the largest Western economies. After all, the countries counted for 40% of the world population and 25% of the world's land. The sky was the limit. It was coming at a time when you know, markets were, emerging markets were opening up much more generally. So, for example, uh, China just joined the WTO. So that, that meant you know, more trade and more interest in the markets. So Brazil you know, had a financial crisis in, in, uh, in the 90s that had ended in a, a devaluation in 1999. So it was coming up and opening up its markets after that. Obviously, we'd had the, the Asian crisis in 97 and the Russian default in, uh, in 1998. The concept exploded from creating a BRICS development bank to business schools offering BRICS courses to investment equity funds. Yeah, the very fact they have this meeting should be embarrassing the G7 countries into... Everyone wanted a piece of the pie. I was at that time in charge of uh, emerging markets for asset management at HSBC. And in 2004, uh, we decided to launch the first uh, fund. And the, um, the, the fund was so successful uh, that after, I think, a year and a half, we had to, to close it to uh, external investors. We were receiving uh, enormous amounts of money uh, every day. I think it was the most uh, successful uh, product ever launched by, uh, by HSBC. In the decade following, the four countries went from accounting for less than 20% to nearly 30% of the world's GDP. It was clear that there was massive catch-up potential, not only for the economies, but also for, for the markets, the size of the markets and the valuations of the markets. Good evening. There were dire predictions Wall about... Wall Street in panic mode this morning comes after one of the most dramatic days in Wall Street history. It's been called the worst financial crisis in modern times. But the BRIC economies avoided a total collapse, at least in the beginning. Quantitative easing, massive stimulus, and rising commodity prices kept them afloat. But that all changed in 2013. After the period of quantitative easing that, that had pumped massive amounts of money into the global economy, the U.S. was starting to think about uh, tightening monetary policy. So when the Fed tightens monetary policy, then U.S. Treasuries become more attractive. That means that the, the money flows back uh, out of risky assets like emerging markets uh, and into safer assets. And uh, of the BRIC countries, so Russia and China had current account surpluses, so they were relatively less vulnerable to global financial tightening, whereas Brazil and, and uh, India had deficits at that time, and, and so that their markets were quite badly hit. It was during this time the main weaknesses of the BRICS concept became obvious. Internal turmoil and politics tipped some of them over. 
in Russia. Of course, we had the Ukraine crisis, the, the annexation of, uh, of Crimea. So that caused investors to be concerned. In Brazil, uh, we had the start of the, the so-called Lava Jato scandal and culminated in, in the imp impeachment of uh, President Dilma Rousseff. So, so that really investors lost a lot of faith in, uh, in Brazil. On, on the other side of the coin, in, in India, you had the election of, um, of Prime Minister Modi. And in China, well, you had had stimulus really since the financial crisis and, and that really that really continued. So, so you had kind of a, a debt fueled growth of, of the economy. But uh, by 2014, China, China and India were, were responding positively to uh, domestic circumstances where, where Russia and Brazil um, were, were going in the other direction. By late 2015, which many called the end of an era, Goldman Sachs announced it was shutting down its BRIC investment fund. At its peak, it had been worth over $800 million, but by closing, it had lost a whopping 88%. Uh, implicit in, in some of the criticism I read about that is this almost even crazier idea that, that one thought the equity markets in the BRIC countries would always rise forever, which is obviously stupid. In 2019, the 11th annual BRIC summit will be in Brazil. And even though the buzz has died off and most investment banks and business schools have stopped offering BRIC-specific courses or funds, the concept has survived, even if just symbolically. There are countries like the BRICS that are becoming as important or more important than the, the G7 countries. Therefore, it makes sense to give them a voice uh, in world affairs. And you know, now you've got the G20s, uh, but now putting them in, a, in one grouping, believing that there is some consistency uh, within this grouping, I don't think makes a lot of sense. Today, the BRICs are producing vastly different results. Brazil and Russia's economies are 20 to 30 percent smaller than they were back in 2011. India and China have grown nearly 50 to 80 percent. 17 years later, we kind of now know for sure what, what I did know when it all started, that, that Brazil and Russia are so heavily dependent on commodities their, their economies just go through this roller coaster ride. And I, I've joked about this, okay? I've sometimes in the past couple of years said maybe I should have called it just X for India and China, but I don't really mean that because Russia and Brazil are obviously really important places. But for their economies to be truly successful and to achieve what we projected for them by 2050, they've got to reduce their dependency on commodities. While the BRICS concept has died down a bit, emerging markets remain a force to be reckoned with. I, d I don't think there's anything quite as, as, as snappy as the, uh, the BRIC acronym. Uh, out of all the other countries that we, we thought about but didn't include, Indonesia theoretically probably has the biggest justification because it's got fantastic dynamics. And intriguingly, despite, despite the number of global shocks since the BRICS concept, Indonesia's not had any major crisis. And then you've also got, uh, you know, countries that are that are open open to trade, um, so dependent on exports. So countries of Southeast Asia, so you know, Thailand, Philippines. Yeah, Vietnam, I think, is very interesting, and I can't help saying, despite how chaotic and problematic it is, because of, just because of its staggering demographics, Nigeria is uh, an interesting place too.